Hello, hello. Hello. So tell everybody your name Hi, and, Gary. and your company yeah, that Daniel. used to you. So. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Daniel. Um, I am, I'll start with the birthday, September 8, 1982, Virgo, um, with Survival Moss, for those of you that don't know. But uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. I can't see you yet. I'm still seeing black, no visual. Oh, sometimes that happens you know i don't know what it is so yeah so we'll just just pretend you're seeing me i'm smiling <laughs> you're always smiling so that's easy so, yeah. so daniel I, first of all um i got the samples uh with the fascial suite and the survival moss with the cinnamon and it's yeah. and it's really good but but i gotta say i i do like the flavor of the maple syrup and yeah but here's what i was thinking vanilla bean extract That'd be a good, that'd be an interesting one because we do add vanilla. Yeah, so, vanilla bean extract or maple extract, organic maple extract, because I like the flavor of it, but the, but I do like what fascial sweet does because fascial yeah. sweet actually regulates the blood sugar. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't spike the blood sugar. I, um, I've been, uh, I've been dabbling with the fascial sweet a little bit and it's, uh, uh, interesting, interesting. And I, I, it's a good combination with certain things, but, um, yeah, Amani was Amani was the one. She was like, "I'm gonna add this to the gel and and see how it pans out." And uh, it, it's not bad. It turned out pretty good, actually. Yeah. So we we our um, fascial uh, flow is Irish sea moss and and fascial sweet. Yeah. And the reason why we did that is because you get all the minerals in, but the fascial sweet basically it's impacting the um, it's impacting the um, what do you call it the the insulin pathways and insulin is the transport mechanism for nutrients so we use the fascial sweet as a way of turbocharging uh the nutrients or the minerals into the cell yeah yeah and um uh took your advice too on the silica also for uh for helping with the absorption uh of minerals into the cell and uh, she's noticed uh quite a difference since adding silica into her diet um, I could actually, you know what? I could actually see it in her hair. Uh, I mean, yeah. I, I'm I'm weird like that. I could know I notice those things, but I could see it in her hair. Her hair looked uh, brighter and healthier. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I, we were talking about potentially, um, maybe even incorporating that somehow into um, maybe a, a future product, having a, an infused silica sea moss um, freeze dried blend. So we're gonna experiment a little bit here down the road but uh i just wanted to say too by the way i really enjoyed that conversation you were having with raw that's kind of like um uh just it's right up my alley i really love um all the the the, the science behind kind of understanding where um what, how how fascia plays into the body and all that wonderful stuff and so um, there was so many, so many times I was like wanting to jump in, <laughs> jump in there and comment with you guys, but that was a great combo. I really appreciated that. You know, it's, we have been, um, we have a lot of science about the body, but we, what we do is we base our science upon a series of lies though. Let me tell you some, um, like, like we have science about performance, but we say the average person breathes, you know, like 15 to 16 breaths per minute. But there's a bunch of science that says after 12 breaths per minute, clinically, we start to hyperventilate. Mm -hmm. and, and so we base all of our all of our known what's good on the average of population. Here's the, the ones that are really unhealthy. Here's the ones that are supposedly healthy. So here's the mental range or here's the healthy ones. Yeah. But but we have all these other things like the bones are structure. Well, none of our bones touch. So saying their structure is it's technically not right. And that's how we started thinking of fascia as structure. And, um, and we couldn't explain things like, like, how do you move when you step on a piece of glass? I mean, it's a really simple concept, but if I'm stepping on a piece of glass, the signal doesn't even get to my, I'm moving before my brain even knows there's a signal and it's not a ganglion reflex. So you can, we can prove that right away. Yeah. So, so we have all this stuff that we've, and, and what I found in healthcare, there's a very consistent behavior. When I ask a question, <clears throat> Well, why is it like that? I'll get a reason. I'll get an answer. But then I ask the question again, second time. So, okay, well, why is it like that? And then 
uh, I'll maybe get an answer 50% of the time. The third time is, oh, that's just how the body is. Yeah. And, and that's a third of every conversation in healthcare. And I'm like, I know. How, how is that possible? I, Manny and I um, lost a lot of faith in our healthcare uh, after she was diagnosed with MS because we were attending, um, you know, we're having conversation after conversation with neurologists and uh, we would come prepared. Like we like to do our research. We like to go in kind of with a, with a really strong general understanding so that we could have um, a, a conversation that was impactful and we could ask questions and, and better understand what's happening. And I never was satisfied with the conversations we had. Like it was, it was almost always we'd ask questions and then the answers were, you know, in many cases, neurologists, when it comes to these types of autoimmune conditions, there's a whole lot of, we don't really know, or we think, uh, you know, dot, dot, dot. And so, yeah, it, it, I think a lot of it, um, uh, it, a lot of times I find myself when I'm, when I'm talking to some of these practitioners, uh, just, I leave the conversation not satisfied or with more questions than I had going in. And so uh, it, it forces you to go find your own answers. And, and find your own path. And um, and at the end of the day, you just have to do what feels intuitively right, you know, for your body, um, which is one of the reasons why I think Amanda and I both um, resonated so well when we met you was was that, and I'll be honest, I'll be the first to admit, I tell, I tell everybody this, prior to meeting you, I'd never heard the, the term fascia. I actually had to Google it. I was like, what is he talking about fascia? What is this fascia? <laughs> And then, and then it opened, it opened my mind to this, there was, there was a body part that I had never heard about before. And I was like, what, how is that possible? Cause I, 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 I consider myself to be a little bit of a jack of all trades. I know a little bit about everything because I like to research. <clears throat> and that was the first time I was exposed to fascia and, um, and listening to you and listening to your philosophy and your way of thinking about, about what the fascia is and its role in the body was really interesting to me. So it felt intuitively, it felt right. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I think I want to thank you for that because I probably, I don't know if I would have been exposed to fascia had it not been for you. And, uh, it's definitely opened up a new, a new, uh, way of thinking, um, about the body and, and, you know, all the different parts of the body and how everything works together and all that. So that was really interesting. That was, um, yeah, so you introduced me to fascia. So, we call you the godfather of fascia, by the way. <laughs> So um, it's funny because everybody wants me to go to these fascia conferences and I'm like, I really don't want to talk to the people at the conferences because they have a different, like, like we're on different planets. We're not even, and I don't want to talk about fascia anymore. I want to talk about how it works, what to yeah. do with it. Because at the end of it, the science mm -hmm. of it, you know, I come from a generation, I'm 54. Everybody wants to know <clears throat> when you get a new phone, what's the processor or a new computer? What's the inside components? And, you know, my kids, they, for the most part, couldn't even tell you that the phone had an antenna or they don't even know the chip. They just know what it does. Yeah. And, and the reality is that's, that's the way it should be. We don't need to know. We just need to know the function of the operation. Totally. But here it is. You guys uh, have, have, you know, pioneered a new way of, of delivering CMOS, which I love. Shelf stable for years. Um, <clears throat> and what I, what I love about it is, <clears throat> that what I really love about it is that, I can give it to kids and they don't even think twice of it. You can put it on cereal, you can put it on a sandwich, you can put it in a salad and they'll eat it. And it has virtually no, no flavor that, that, that that's noticeable. And it's, and it's this freeze dry, but CMOS, the body needs a hundred and uh, two minerals. Correct. And the way that I describe it is I come from a telecom or networking background. So like I know, data networking, telecom, stuff like this. So there's a cloud that we all have on our iPhones. <clears throat> and those that the iPhone has all these apps. And each one of those apps has a direct line or PVC or SVC, like a virtual circuit that goes right to some sort of server to run that app. So it has a connection. So my phone has all these connections through the cloud to different areas to get information, to store, uh, to store photos and stuff like that. And, and what I describe it is, is that if one of those connections isn't there, 
like if I can't get my photos uh, on my phone itself, I can go into my cloud and get them. And if I can't get them on my cloud, I could probably get them through some of my email or another folder, or I can probably get them on my social media. Now I'm still getting that same picture, but I'm not getting it. Like if I can't get it on my phone directly, I can go to my cloud and get it. If I can't get there, I can get it in other places. So I can find a photo if I lose it. Right. But that's what taking out one of the minerals in uh, in our body is like. It does. It has to work around to, to go get yeah. the end result. Mm -hmm. And this is what Irish she moss does. It's, it has all of those connections that we need in order to function the body. And most of them are actually in the fashion. Yeah. Yeah. And and um, my background's in network as well, by the way. So I love that analogy. Um, and you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, you you can survive um, in a state of mineral deficiency, but your body has to work harder. And um, in doing so, you you there may be a trickle effect. You may create uh, other problems that might not surface right away, but take a little while. It's, it's I truly believe that mineral deficiency is. Um, one of the one of the major causes of chronic illnesses it's it's mineral deficiencies left unchecked for a really long period of time the body having to compensate for that yeah. and then um, you know you find yourself in a state where you're like what's going on what, what's causing this what's causing that I, I even I, I hate the term autoimmune because it's like this blanket statement um, and it allows in most cases, Anytime you talk to a doctor about autoimmune conditions, they're basically like, we don't know what causes it. We, the immune system is overactive. Well, I, I kind of refuse to believe that. I don't think, and a lot of times they'll describe it as like, there's something wrong with the immune system. Um, I don't believe that at all. I think there's something very right with the immune system. The immune system is doing probably what it was designed to do. The problem is, is you can't, um, you can't continue in a state of deficiency forever. Eventually, you're gonna you're gonna you know find yourself um, uh, just overwhelmed. It's like it's kind of like a like a Dyson vacuum, right? The Dyson vacuum sucks very well. It's doing its job, but if you don't empty that Dyson every so often, you you know it's gonna stop doing its job eventually. And so um, that's to me that's what autoimmune conditions are. Your immune system is doing what it's supposed to do, but it gets to the point where um, you know, it's, it's just overwhelmed. It's, it's, you're not, um, <clears throat> it's not getting, a, it's not getting a break and, and, and it's not, it doesn't have all the tools that it needs to do its job. And, um, and that's kind of where minerals come in. A lot of minerals are overlooked, right? A lot of people focus on vitamins and they focus on a lot of these, um, mainstream talking points, but, but rarely do we talk about minerals and we never talk about the fact that most of our foods are due to conventional farming are, Kind of devoid of minerals compared to what they were you know 10 20 30 years ago <clears throat> so um you got to get those minerals from somewhere and uh that's that's what led us to cmos it was it's one of the few natural sources out there and i'm i'm a believer of getting um all of your nutrition from whole foods i like the idea yeah. of just being able to take something from the earth and put that into your body and get what you need from it and um, and that's kind of what led us to CMOS. It's it's of all the different things we looked at, that's that was the most mineral dense uh, source for for nutrition. And so, yeah, it was it was uh, only natural for us. I mean, we were, we had already, but I so I I don't know if you know too much about freeze drying. Um, actually, the process. actually, I, I I mean, I don't other than you know I freeze freeze dried. Uh, plants and animal products over my life to extend the life. But tell me, tell me something about freeze dry. Cause I'm a nerd. I like, I like the science behind things, right? I like to understand exactly what this is. And so before we even freeze dried our first bit of CMOS gel, we had actually, uh, we had a freeze dryer and we were freeze drying all kinds of things. We were everything from like, I mean, we would even freeze dry candy. Cause that was like the quintessential, like everybody knew what freeze dried Skittles was. Uh, but we we had experimented with freeze drying a lot of freeze dry skittles. Yeah, yeah. Because so whenever you remove the moisture from anything, what you're left with is basically concentrated molecules. Everything that is not water in that substance, that's what you're left with. And so with skittles, when you remove all the moisture, so it's no longer chewy. Now it's really brittle, easy to bite, and crunchy. But the flavor molecules, uh, because there's no moisture there it almost seems like there's 10 times the amount of flavor molecules. So picture what a Skittle tastes like when you chew it. 
Now imagine if it were just dry and crunchy, but but more flavorful. That's why the so pineapples, it, the free dried pineapple pieces you gave me are so damn good. I like, know. those are candy. 100%. And so, so, cause you remove all the moisture, all you're left with is the flavor molecules and the nutrition and everything else that's in there. Everything that's not water, right? So, but the, it was the process that even got me to buy a freeze dryer because freeze drying is, is like whoever comes up with this stuff. I always, I have, I have this conversation all the time with many, who invented this thing, right? I, same thing with like the MRI and there's a lot of technologies where when you get into how did this technology works, it's like, are there aliens living among us? I mean, we know the answer to that, but, um, but freeze drying is a really interesting one because you take food and you put it in a, in a chamber, in a vacuum chamber, um, no vacuum yet, you freeze it down to about minus 40. Um, and it's just solid ice, all the water in that food, just completely solid ice. Then you expose it to a vacuum that's pretty close to the vacuum of space. It's the equivalent of about 100,000 feet off the surface of the earth. What happens in that environment is a process called sublimation, where the ice is converted into vapor directly. It bypasses the middle stage. Normally, to convert water, um, it, it, ice to, to, to take ice and turn it into a vapor, you would have to heat it, turn it into water, it would boil, and then it would turn into a vapor. You bypass that middle step altogether. You sublimate the ice directly into a vapor. That vapor then condensates on and builds up on the outside of the chamber you can actually see ice forming on the outside of the chamber and then you're left with food that was in whatever state it was in because when you freeze it obviously minus 40 it holds its shape it holds its its state and you literally are able to remove the moisture from it without impacting anything else so it'll retain 97 percent of the nutrition um, and then once you take it out of there as long as you're putting it in an airtight vessel um, with an oxygen absorber bag and you're not exposing it to sunlight. Those are the three things that degrade food. It'll have a shelf life of 25 years at room temperature, just about anything. Not quite everything. There are certain things like uh, fats don't do well in uh, in freeze dryers. Sugars don't really do that well in freeze dryers. Um, but just about everything else um, can be preserved using this method. And it it lended wow. itself. Yeah, so it's, is, a, it's a fit. It, there, so is there actually like, um, um, is it like a... Uh, like a steam, like you'd see steam on a glass is on the outside, but it's like an ice. It, the, the entire process doesn't, um, you don't see the vapors. It's it's kind of like an invisible magic, but um, there is a, so on most freeze dryers, on, on our home freeze dryer before, I mean, we've obviously commercialized our process, but when we were doing it in our early stages, um, we have a freeze dryer at home that has a, a thick glass window. It's like a two inch glass window. And so you can kind of look into the chamber as the process is happening. Now this process takes three days with CMOS because there's so much moisture content in the gel. Um, there, you can't see the vapor. You just slowly see the ice building up on the, on the outside of this giant metal chamber. It just starts building and building and building. Uh, and then if you're looking at the trays, and the trays, by the way, are simultaneously, while it's being exposed to um, vacuum, the trays are being heated slightly. So it's it's in a minus 40 degree uh, environment with a crazy vacuum. And then the trays are being heated just slightly, uh, like 60, 70 degrees. And then that's what kind of kicks off the sublimation process. So, so, it's so a, my, my brain goes to, uh, my brain goes to, can I chop up that ice and snort it? <laughs> It's really interesting because it's very pure water. Well, I was going right? to say, you're, it would have to have, it, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it technically have the information from the product? Well, probably, absolutely. Yeah, so I would imagine. So, so. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, I'd like to try this. I'm guessing I could scrape that ice and eat it and take information from it that would signal my body because here, here's something that people don't really get about the human body, okay? This is food and food consumption. If I consume 10 pounds of food in water, I urinate, defecate, and sweat out 10 pounds. Mm -hmm. So that means the only thing that's left is information because everything left out, everything went. Yep. So this is why homeopathic works. You distill something 30 times and you take it, you get the information. I'd be curious to know if, if that, what that means that all my body, all everything in my body, like all the vitamins, because you said the focus is on vitamins, not minerals. Well, our body actually produces vitamins. Yeah. That's what our liver does. But we're not yeah. told that. Yeah. 
Yeah. It uses the minerals. Your organs use the minerals to produce a lot of vitamins. So I'm yeah. wondering, I'm wondering if, if, like, I want to do this now. I'm wondering if I, if I take the ice and if I consume that ice, I'm wondering if it actually will, will signal to my body production of something. Well, it's interesting because the last step in the freeze drying process is to, <clears throat> to clean out the chamber. Um, and so there's a, uh, you put it in defrost mode and then it will slowly defrost the ice walls. This is after you've removed your product. Um, and then it goes through a drain valve and, and it actually goes into a reservoir that we collect and we dump. I want um, to drink that water. I was just going to say that the next time, the next time I do something, maybe I'll collect some of that water for you and I'll be, well, this is pineapple. I want, water. I want to drink that water. I, I do. Maybe I want to drink that water. Because... We'll do an experiment. Maybe we'll do an experiment and see if you yeah, can tell which can, water. You know, you we can use uh, like an AO scanner or, um, or an impedance scanner, like, uh, um, to, to tell if the nutrients is in your body. Yeah. So like, like, uh, AO scanning. And for those of you guys who are out there, they're, they're really cool. They actually use a picture and then the voice frequency and they combine it of you over the phone, but they can tell you, like, they could tell me that I ate a certain type of food that day. Yeah. I, I'm That's super, pretty wild. I am super excited now. Now I want to go get a freeze dryer. I'm going to, I'm going to bottle different, I'm going to jar some different uh, freeze dryer liquids and, uh, and I'll see if you can, I'll see, uh, I'll maybe like just label them with something generic and keep it on my end. And then you can run some tests and we'll do like a blind test. Yeah, let's, let's do that. Let's do that. Let's absolutely do that because I'm, I'm super sensitive. Like I can tell if something goes in my body, I can tell the effects of it, like within cool. seconds. That's awesome. So, so, That's awesome. so this, so this whole process of free driving with the with the CMOS because the thing about CMOS that I like is that it gives me it gives me 94 of the 102 minutes. Now, um, it can take bladder rack. Have you ever put a thought about bladder rack adding yeah. that in? Yeah. Because bladder wax got a lot of uh, different minerals and trace minerals. Yeah, in it brings as well. all, all of them together. So if you were to do that, um, what I like about it is is that when I make it, and I love the gel, and I love the fact that you guys make the gel. It's easier, but yeah. But when I make it or I'm taking the gel, I what I what I miss is the fact that if I don't get it fast enough, so I can make a whole bunch, then then it goes bad, and um and so uh, it's not shelf stable. So. What I like about the freeze dried is that I can carry it with me anywhere. Even if I open the bag, it's still generally good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's, that, so that brings me to another point because we get a lot of people that ask us this. So um, I, I get people ask me, they're like, well, I bought the bag. Um, how do I rec reconstitute it? And, um, and while you can, uh, just, just to give you an idea. So our small bag is this guy here, 15 grams. Looks like a tiny amount. It, it, but it's the equivalent of one jar, right? And so when you take a jar, uh, this has a lot of moisture content. This is basically mostly moisture, as you can see, right? Yeah. When you freeze dry this amount of gel, it turns into this amount of uh, powder. Now, you can absolutely take this, dump it into a jar, fill it up with water, um, you know, give it a solid shake, throw it in the fridge, and, you know, within within a couple minutes, you'll start to see it turn gelatinous within about an hour, maybe two hours, um, it'll turn back into a jar, a full jar. But it, it really defeats the purpose because once you take that freeze dried powder and turn it into a gel, you, the clock starts ticking. Now you have, you know, three weeks to four weeks to consume it. Um, whereas the, the idea behind this is that you can keep it in that state inside that bag for, you know, a year, two years once you've opened the bag. I mean, 25, if you don't open the bag, it can sit shelf stable for a long time. But once you open the bag, you expose it to some ambient moisture. Yeah. Yeah. It's still a year or two years, like it'll last a really long time. That shouldn't last you that long, but like you would probably consume a 15 gram bag. I consume a 15 gram bag in a few weeks anyways, because I just keep it in my car. That's the whole point is you can keep it somewhere on the go. You don't need a fridge and you really just want to take one scoop out and that's your daily consumption. Well, sorry, two scoops, two to four scoops is what I recommend. Um, that's your daily consumption. Throw it into a liquid, your teas, your coffees, throw it into your yogurt. It doesn't need a lot of moisture. It'll absorb pretty quickly. And it's ready to consume almost right away. Like when I add it to my coffee, I start drinking my coffee right away. I don't mind if it's not fully soft and jelly yet, but um, within about 30 seconds to a minute, like you, you don't, 
it's gone. It's it basically sure. is a gel in whatever you've added it to. Right. And the, um, the that little that little scooper that you have in the in the in the freeze dry bag, um, yeah. How uh, is that like a tablespoon? No. So if you look at it, you'll notice that first of all, this is the side profile of this. It's flat. Mm. Um, we had to go to this to get it to fit inside the mylar bags and not take up too much space. Um, but this spoon here, so you know, obviously when you're when you're scooping a scoop, uh, you you kind of want to try and get as much as you can on that scoop. And when you do that, this little heaping scoopful ends up being a teaspoon of powder. So if you take this and you throw it into a little measuring, uh, yeah, you know, you get sure. those little multi spoon measuring kits. That's a teaspoon. Once you rehydrate that, um, it makes about a tablespoon worth. So one scoop. And how much would that be in milligrams? Do you know roughly? Mm, I don't know. It's it's. I think if you were to just look at uh, convert tablespoon to to milligrams, you could just do the conversion, and it would be exactly that. I know that it's the equivalent of taking a one tablespoon of the gel. <clears throat> That's about how much you're consuming. So with with one scoop, roughly. I mean, it really depends. Like sometimes I go in there and I get a heaping scoop, but sometimes it's a little bit less than a heaping scoop. So there's not an exact science, but it's roughly about that. And so uh, when you're taking the gels, you wanna basically be doing, you know, uh, one to two tablespoons on the lower end so that you can feel the effects of it um, a day. Anything less than that, you probably, you might not feel the effects of it. So that's kind of where we, that's our baseline recommendation. Now, I don't consume it at the baseline. I consume, Wait you know, two to four to six sometimes it really depends and so there that's a recommendation but really i would i would uh, allow your body intuitively to tell you how much you need uh, i like uh i really <clears throat> um i promote heavily that because of the way that the body takes uh, we memorize delivery systems so mm -hmm. the body like pavlov's dog so if i if I ring a bell every time I give you a chicken wing, if you like chicken wings, the next time I ring the bell, your body starts creating the enzymes and the profiles to digest it. Right. So I really like the idea of using sea moss in a smoothie, in a soup. Soups are really yeah. good. And, yeah. and the reason why is because then when I make that soup again, my body is already preparing itself for the nutrients. Yeah, your brain prepares your stomach, the enzymes, everything starts to happen before you even get it into your, into your mouth. Yeah. Absolutely. And that increases absorption and and yeah it's, that's it's why a, i tell people like that's you know it's i don't want people like we sell supplements for convenience uh, the freeze dry actually is 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 a convenience mechanism but we sell supplements for convenience and also to create habits because people what i've noticed <clears throat> is that when we we're applying this um a lot of people the habit of taking and getting a, a gel and eating it it takes a while to develop a habit but i can get them to do a pill on a daily basis but we tell people we don't want them to take pills long term like we we say yeah. take our supplements and then leave them behind have them there for use but we want people to take sea moss in this in its origin form we want them to take horsetail silica or diatomaceous earth in the origin form and use it in different ways yep. because because the these whole like the pill culture that we have isn't a great culture but it does allow us to habituate a process and when somebody's coming out of a disease process they, their their minds are cluttered already that's why yeah. i like pills for that yeah. yeah true very true and um and i agree i agree with you 100 percent. like um there's nothing wrong with taking supplements supplements are great and um especially when you need them in an acute way and, and, and you're you're going through something um, I've taken many supplements, uh, but, but you're right. There is something to be said about, about allowing the body to do what it does naturally. And, and, you know, when, when you look at a banana, um, and you, and you, and you, you know, you're about to eat that banana, uh, there's quite a bit that starts to happen. I mean, first thing you notice is you start to salivate, right? And this is your body preparing the food just to get into your mouth. Uh, and it starts breaking, there's enzymes in your saliva and you start to break down that food almost right away. And whether you realize it or not, your stomach's doing the same thing. You're already producing the acids that your stomach needs to digest that banana and your body's going through a whole bunch of stuff. And so when you do that, you are better utilizing the food. You're better utilizing the nutrition from that food. Your body's preparing it, breaking it down, et cetera. Um, you know, if you can take it, it maybe, maybe you can trick the body by 
taking your supplements at the same time that you're consuming real food yeah. so that you can kind of uh, hide yeah, you can, hide that it has a memory but there there is there is something to it because it, it's like it's it's the same way like if you take an espresso and you you press it longer and harder or if you mix ingredients into a uh into a cake whatever it changes the it changes the way it tastes like totally there is a there is something to be said i do encourage people not to take our pills all the time i encourage them to go and buy survival moss and start using it as a, a in their food because the delivery system is a is a habituated system that that the body starts using firing hormones and, and preparing preparing enzymes to use it in yeah. advance and the challenge with the pills is that your body technically doesn't know which pill is which pill yeah yeah, yeah. and because it bypasses a very important part of digestion which is moment on the lips lifetime in the hips <laughs> is that where they use that uh, that saying okay yeah yeah because yeah. uh because it's, it's actually <laughs> what it is is technically it, that where the actual saying is, is is that once i touch my lips with it all of the all of the attributes of that food is already there and the mass of food doesn't create weight but the hormone distribution from the food creates weight right because the mass comes in and goes out right think about it. 10 pounds in yep. 10 pounds out yep. so what is it about the food that does that what it is is that it fires at a hormone array which that's hormones are what's hit the save button on our on our emotions and that save button determines where that emotion sits in my body. And that's what fat is. That's why, that's why when I fasted for 44 days, I was still fat. Yeah. I mean, I mean there's, there's no way that I should have had, I should have looked fat at the end of 44 days. And Interesting, I, hey? Yeah, I'll show you a picture. It's like bizarre. I still can't see you. I'm still looking at black, imagining your smile. Oh, right, 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 right. Okay, well, I'll, I'll show it for everybody else who's not there. Um, because because what happened was is I fasted for forty four days, and and uh, and and the forty fourth day of the fast, you know, here I was, I had I had what looked like fat, and I'm like, how is that possible that I had fat? You can watch the replay. So I'm like, how is that possible? I went from here, I just went to a like slightly less version, but that was six weeks without food, and I should have been like skinny as a rail, you would but I wasn't. Think. Yeah. yeah, and and so this is this is part of this was like the final part of my thesis on fascia and fascial maneuvers as we have it today, is how do I explain that I didn't lose all that weight when I was fasting? There has to be an explanation, and I wasn't catching that explanation. So so this is where I started to develop a new theory. So that weight came off. I fasted for eighteen months. It still wasn't coming off. I I would do like one week, seven days, 10 days, two week fasting. And I did that for a year and a half. And then finally, I started processing the beliefs and the emotions. And then all of a sudden, it was like over here. It was like, I went in, I wish I had a picture in June because I went to um, Maya Khan and, and I, I sat, we were out of, off the grid completely where there was no power, no electricity, um, nothing for 30 days. We were on this resort in the Maya Khan, Siakon Reserve. Right. And and then I came back from that resort. And then when I came back from that resort, I had literally I it looked like I had lost weight. And then I came back to Canada. I didn't do any I didn't do any fashion maneuvers, didn't change my diet at all. And then boom, 20 pounds came off in like 10 days and wow. nothing changed in my life. <clears throat> and so, again, the the question was what I was trying to do is answer the question is, how is that possible? Right. And. And this is where I, I came. So there is a commensurate relationship between I work equals force times distance. If I lift a weight and move, I have a metabolic function. But that doesn't describe doing a fascial maneuver like a pretzel squat and me sweating bullets after 12 breaths. Exactly. So Because I can run on a treadmill uh, for 30 minutes without sweating bullets. So, so, there, so there has to be this relationship that we weren't looking at. And the way I define it is that metabolic function is above blood volume in the lungs. And the more blood volume I push to the lungs, the more metabolic function I have. And if I lift the weight and move, I'm going to put more blood volume in there. But that's not the formula that works because that formula can be usurped through patterning. Like if I run on a treadmill the first time, I sweat. But after doing it every day for like three months, right. I don't even notice it. You acclimate. Yeah. And that acclimation means that the formula of, uh, for, for caloric burn 
work equals force For times sure. distance, that means it can't yeah. be that can't be true. Because yeah. acclimation, if it's work equals force times different, if that math is there, then it doesn't matter how many times I run on that treadmill, I should still have the same metabolic effect. But mm. this is a whole world of science and a whole world of sports nutrition and science and measurement that just go, well, you're just, it's your, your metabolism changed. And I'm like, what do you mean changed? How, like, explain what changed means. Because you told me it was, it was a binary formula that said, if I did this, I got this. Yeah, there's a scientific formula to it. Yeah. And now it's changed. So what I have found, though, is I found that <laughs> When I release less emotions, I have less weight storage. Mm. Or when I process a lot of emotions, the first thing that would happen for me is that my body would swell up like I got fat. Like mm. literally, I'd get puffy, and then I would, and then just like that sea moss, I would let all the water go. Wow, that's interesting. <clears throat> yeah, it, it's, wow. we, I'm not even pretending that I even know. I, I'm saying that I can prove that the way that we look at the body, I can prove it's not that way exactly. It's incomplete. I it yeah, sure. I, I, it doesn't mean I know all the answers. I have a theory that I'm working with, and that theory allows me to talk about it, but that's it. Well, and that's, but that's what science is, really. It's, um, science is ever evolving. To claim that we have the answer about anything is, is incorrect, because at every stage of history, that um that generation thought they they had the answers right and then and then the next generation comes along and they're like well actually this new research shows that that was incorrect and this is the way we need to look at it and and then the next generation goes well technically that's incorrect and this is how we need to look at it and i mean that's <clears throat> it, and i i kind of liken this to even um the science of, of like quantum physics right quantum physics came along and completely erased normal physics like the way that we look at the world is is turned upside down it, onto its head it's actually it, you know it's funny because it, it did it erased the normal physics but minutes. when you ask somebody about our lives and our bodies we use normal physics yeah isn't that isn't that funny and, and you know what this is actually what led me like i consider myself to be spiritual but not in the same way that most people are spiritual like i'm I believe in in the metaphysical. I believe in in the power of the mind. I believe in a lot of these things, and it's because of the science. It's because of, um, you know, I, I always go back and I, I tell people that I'm sure you know the double slit experiment. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Some of your viewers may not know, so let's just go over it. The double slit experiment was an experiment that was done that completely turned our understanding of life upside down, um, and it gave birth to a whole new world of, of science and the double slit experiment uh, i mean i'm going to butcher it but i'm just going to kind of summarize it as quickly as i can was basically um they experimented by firing protons from a specialized machine they would fire protons through a slit and uh there was a detector on the back end that would detect those protons hitting um hitting the sensor yeah. and so when they ran this experiment the first time, they were expecting the protons, because they're being fired in a beam, to behave the same way that light behaves, which is if you shine a flashlight through a little slit, when you shine it onto the wall, you would expect to see a white slit of light. And instead, what they saw was an interference pattern. Effectively, what would happen if you were to splash the water and that wave would travel to where the sensor was, it created that type of an interference pattern on the on the wall, and they were like, "Well, that's weird. We need to see, we need to see what's happening." And so they brought in a detector that would actually monitor the protons going through the slit. And when they did that, and they ran the experiment again, all of a sudden, on the detector side, it showed up the way that light would normally behave. It started behaving like you would expect it to behave, and they were like, "Okay." So they removed the observer, the, the observer that was watching the protons go through the slit, they removed it and boom, it went back to being an interference pattern on the, uh, on the sensor side. Right. And they were like, wait a minute, let's do this with two slits. So they did it with two slits. Same thing. There was an interference pattern. And then as soon as they put in a detector to actually observe the protons passing through the slits, then all of a sudden it behaved like two lights. And what this, the, the moral of that story, that, that, that um, that one experiment proved that our reality 
our physical matter isn't physical matter unless there is a conscious observer. When there's not a conscious observer, our physical reality behaves more like a probability of waves. That means that we are literally the creators of our reality. And, and not in like a, like a metaphysical sense, literally, in a physical yes. sense. We actually, and, and it goes back to like, you ever hear that old saying where it's like, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's around to hear it, does it make a noise? No, no, it doesn't. The observer is required. That tree in the forest is a probability of waves until there's an observer that actually observes it and that collapses the wave function and turns it into what we call reality. And that just, it, 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 that's what opened the floodgates to quantum physics. That's what opened the floodgates to um, a lot of different things. And it made me realize that we don't know anything. We know nothing. We know very little about our environment. We know very little about the world we live in. We know nothing. That's, and um, That's why when they talk about science in the body, we know what 5,000 of our proteins actually do well and there are millions of proteins so to say that we understand the human body anywhere scientifically and people look that's the way it is that's the science so there's some smart guys out there that are going around saying that and i'm like yeah you gotta come over and spend a little bit of time with us you're gonna you're gonna find a whole new science of the body. yeah the, the, the science is never settled is the bottom line and and uh, i think that's what makes humans unique is we constantly ask questions and look for other angles and we're, we're constantly going down that rabbit hole and so yeah i i um i'm with you there like we i don't believe that we have all the answers especially when it comes to the human body i don't think we know anything about the human body we don't. i think we we like to pretend like we know but this is the most complicated machine uh, and the further we dig into it the more we realize we we have no clue what's going on like we can kind of start to understand general processes and we can observe things that are happening and we can see a cause and effect, but like the underlying mechanisms and how it's all coming together is so foreign. And, mm -hmm. and um, it, you have to assume that, that there's a bunch of stuff we're missing and a bunch of things that are connected that we haven't figured out yet. And a bunch of, it's just, it's, it's, we don't know anything. Science, the more I learn, we don't, from, we don't, we don't, the more, it, yeah, it's, the it's, more I learn about science, the more we realize we don't know anything. Yeah. And you know, and, and this is actually this is actually the truth about where we're at. But we we have this romanticized version that that we're intelligent, we're doing better. But you know, at at one point, and this is what I love about what you guys are doing is you're 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 just taking a simple result, which actually it's funny because if you look at the all the all the headlines of CMOS, you're gonna get well, it's really bad. You see thyroid issues. It's like they're literally trying to stop people from taking it. Uh especially for thyroid issues and Elon Musk, what I love about him, he goes, you know, there's one plant you better be acquainted with in the future and that's CMOS. Elon Musk said that, right? And, yeah. and there's a reason why. And anything, it's like uh, when you get into boron and the delivery systems for boron, there's yeah. a reason why. Now, by the way, I, I, I do want to say that I think you should take some of our power, Kirk, we'll send it to you. And I do we think you should take some. Yeah, okay. But I mean, I want you to take some from, um, I want you to take and uh, make a blend. Because what we do is we do a curcumin cake, a pie, yeah. Yeah. talking about delivery systems. If And it's hydrophobic, so it, sh it should still work. But you should take mm -hmm. some power curc by dose, put it in there, and, and see what happens to it. I my, We have a drink, a collagen drink with it. But the challenge that I've seen is that it <laughs> it actually, you know, it, it, it makes stuff orange. Kirkman will do that, right? Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> try, try it though. But, uh, but I listen, um, I'm super excited about uh, about our relationship with you guys. I like the idea of the freeze dried. It allows us to actually warehouse and ship your stuff too. At some point, we yeah. have uh, like yeah. we have we have stuff in the United States, and I think I think uh, maybe we'll talk about getting it, getting it, getting stuff there because we have we already have distribution out there to make it a lot easier but i'm super excited about your process i'm super excited that it's shelf stable that you can take it anywhere and the biggest part is kids will consume it they eat it raw i know i know and you can you can actually take it and just throw it in there and and just chomp away your saliva is moisture enough but you probably want to have a glass of water beside you if you're doing that because it will absorb all of the moisture in your mouth and you'll be left with a pretty um depending on how much you threw in there, of course, but, but
but yeah, you'll, it'll it'll absorb the moisture right out of there. It'll it'll soak up all your saliva, which is make, make it'll make it harder to swallow. But um, yeah, it's you know what it's been um, it's been a bit of a game changer. We really wanted to make this product more accessible. Getting gel is hard because if you're buying it online, you, you have to deal with products that are full of preservatives because that's the only way really to get around the logistics of dealing with gels. Um, and we don't we don't like preservatives. We don't want people to be consuming preservatives. It kind of goes against our entire mission. This whole uh, moving in, in a healthier direction, and and finding people that do it locally and that are high quality products can be a little bit difficult too. And so um, that was kind of the challenge we wanted to solve. That's what we set out to do. Um, and and I think this is the best case scenario. We found a way to do it where we're not using any preservatives, no additives. We're retaining all that nutrition. It's shelf stable, uh, and that's. And I want to loop back to what I was saying earlier. Don't buy this product and turn it into a gel. Use it by the dose. That's how it was intended to be used. That's the best way to use it. And um, and you then you sell the raw and, ingredient though. You can just buy the raw ingredient and make it yourself totally. if you want to. Yeah, we do. Different, yeah, different uses. Like they have a different usage. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. And if you want to experiment on your own and and you know make the gels yourself, you can absolutely do that as well. Yeah. Um. And and it's, we do it's we fun do, to do that actually. Yeah. It's fun to actually to actually try that one as well. Everybody should be a little bit connected to their food source, and so I don't think it's a bad thing to to kind of experiment. If you're the kind of person that likes to do that, by all means, we encourage that too. And we would always every time we do a farmers market, we've got some bags of just the the sun dried. Uh, fresh sea moss and and occasionally we get customers that will come and grab those from us usually what ends up happening is they'll come back to the next market and they'll be like ah, i like the way you guys do it i'm gonna just grab it but yeah yeah, yeah. But it, I mean, there's, there's, to... it takes a while it takes a while to do it right yeah daniel listen yeah, it's been it's been great chatting with you today um it's uh i really like the partnership i want everybody who takes sea moss to to not only take our fascial flow to buy uh survival moss and the in the shelf uh, and the freeze-dried shelf-stable um, uh, uh, sea moss. And I'm just looking forward to where this goes. Uh, you know what? We really appreciate you guys, everything you guys are doing. I, I love your mission. I love I love the direction. And we're just excited to be a part of this with you. And, um, yeah, I, I, I'm, of course, from the bottom of my heart, appreciate your support and supporting our product. But more than that, we, we're just really happy to be kind of going on the journey with you guys and, and um, uh, making an impact. I love what you guys are doing. We're, we're very excited about that. So thank you. Thank you for having me on. And Thanks, um, Daniel. yeah, I look it's great to talking to you. I love the conversations. I can talk with you like we're off. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should do a three-way combo next that time. That would be good. Take care, <laughs> man. Right. Thanks. Take care.